I'm gonna look towards uh, probably one of my favorite Marvel movies. I don't know if it's my absolute favorite because Endgame ranks up there pretty high as well, um, but definitely one of the more preferred ones that I have uh, is Captain America Civil War. And this one isn't officially like an Avengers Avengers movie, but it basically is as close to making an official Avengers movie without actually being an Avengers movie. It was tied all the new characters they had brought together. It put a bunch of the old characters that you had seen. Um, and it brought in, again, like I said, some of the new characters like Black Panther, um, Spider-Man, uh, and Ant-Man. It brought them all together into one awesome movie just to kind of go through. And at the same time, you had this huge conflict that they were trying to figure out, right? Like, who should the Avengers be accountable to? Right? You had Captain America and he was on the side saying we should be accountable to ourselves like we don't want to be responsible to the politicians they shouldn't be the ones to tell us when we should save the world when we shouldn't save the world and then on the other side of that you had Iron Man who was saying like well no we need oversight like because of what he did in his research and, and creating Ultron which again destroyed basically an entire country he was like I need checks and balances and I think just as superheroes we need those things to kind of to set us where we're supposed to be so you had these two opposing sides kind of trying to figure out, well, who should be governing the Avengers, right? And it led to this epic brawl, again, just between all the Avengers that had been gathered together. You had equal places on both teams, some people saying one way or the other. And again, it kind of started just that, uh, that trending uh, hashtag of whether you were hashtag Captain America or hashtag Iron Man. Because again, people just wanted to choose sides of who they thought was technically right. And while in our Bible, essentially, we don't have anything quite as epic in terms of movie, theatrics, and all kinds of special effects, we do come to a point in our Bible where we enter into what's essentially a civil war. And again, it may not have the special effects budget that the Marvel movies do, but I think it has a much higher impact and everlasting significance that we look at here this morning as we continue in our series, uh, Father of a Nation. And so if you have your Bibles, if you have your devices, we're going to be picking that up. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 14, Genesis chapter 14. And while you're turning there, again, let me kind of recenter us as to where we've been so far. Okay, we are starting off this story, again, this is Abraham, who's the father of all nations, but this is kind of his quote-unquote origin story. That's the beginning part of where he develops, first from Abram, and eventually, again, in, few, in actually a chapter or two, he'll become Abraham, who received this new name from God to be Abraham. But here at this moment, he's still just Abram. And we saw at the very beginning how he took this huge step of faith and just trusting God when he said, Abram, go. And just that's it, just go. And he was like, okay. He listened and he obeyed God. And he took this huge step of faith. And he entered into Canaan eventually. And then we saw this massive step of fear that he takes. Where he sees that there's a famine in the land. And he gets scared. And so he runs to Egypt. And he lies about who his wife is. And all kinds of things happen. And it's just by the grace of God that he gets out of it. Just on the skin of his back. He, he makes it through. But not only that, God blesses him even more so because of it. And then last week we saw this interesting development in the story where Abram and his nephew Lot, they kind of have these issues between their men, which almost to a certain extent starts to cause issues between them, causes strife between them. And we see this moment of faith in Abram when he tells Lot, like, whichever way you want to go, like, I, I have the authority, I have the priority to choose, but you know what, I yield that you to you, Lot. You can choose whichever direction you want to go because I trust God so much that it doesn't matter which direction I go. I know God will take care of me. And so Lot chooses the lush, beautiful side and he gives Abram the other side, but he doesn't quite see. We get it foreshadowed that, that on that lush, beautiful side is also people who aren't so lush and beautiful, if I could say it that way. They're a little bit more wicked. It's described that they are sinners of people who are against the Lord, the people who are living, in this case, in Sodom. And so we hear that Lot settles near Sodom, and he continues there. And we now pick up the story just to see, okay, so now that Lot has settled in this land near Sodom, and Abram has settled on the other side, we now kind of develop the story and see what happens next. And so again, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 14. We're going to be in verse 1. And I'm going to qualify this. I'm probably going to mispronounce a bunch of these names here. So again, if you are reading through and you have no idea how to say that, you're on the same team as me. I am going to do my best to get through this, and so we'll see how this goes. So, verse 1. In the days of Mamraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elassar, I forgot to look up this name, Chedolomerir, 
I'm going to go with that. I'm going to say that two or three times, and I'm going to butcher the ball every single time. Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Gaom. These kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, or Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and king of Bela. That is Zoar. I think that's most of them. So again, we'll continue from here. And all these joined forces in the Valley of Siddam. That is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Shedolimir, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Shedolimir and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Asheroth Karnim, and Zuzim in Ham, and Imim in Shava Kirathim. And the Horites in their hill country of Ser, as far as El Paran, on the border of the wilderness. And then, then they turned back and came to En Mishfath, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites, who were dwelling in the Hazan Tamar. And then the king of Sodom, king of Gomorrah, Gomorra, and king of Adma, and king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim. When Shalomar, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goem, Amphra, Am Raphael, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elasar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill countries. So the enemy took all their possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their provisions, and went their way. Whew, okay, I made it. I think most of the hard names are done. I think I referenced a couple other ones here, there, give or take. But either way, again, we have a lot happening here in these first 11 verses. Right in this first section, again, just lays out a lot of what's happening in this war that we are seeing, right? This civil war between four kings versus the five kings that we have laid out. And I'm not going to say those names again, even if you want me to. Those four kings in the northeast versus the five kings that are in the south by the Salt Sea. And for you, I don't know, as I read through this, I understood it, but I, I didn't quite gather everything that had happened. And it wasn't until I was studying and I found this map that I was like, wow, this makes so much more sense looking through this. So I want to kind of redo this whole section, verses 1 through 11, and kind of look through and see just as they progress through the land of Canaan here. So if you want, again, it's on the screen. Hopefully that's visible enough for you here. But again, in verse 1, you have these established four kings coming in from the northeast. That's these kind of two lines that you see up top. You have all these kings coming in from the northeast, and they're going through, and they're settling through the land. They're, they're conquering the area, and they've basically been rulers over the land until this revolt happens. So they come in to quell this rebellion. And then in verse 2, you hear that there are five kings in the Salt Sea, which is more towards the middle over here, give or take. And again, we'll get to that in a second. But they kind of just establish the key players that are kind of going about. And then in verse 5, we skip down a little bit, as again, the other verses are just naming the people. In verse 5, we see the four kings from the northeast. They're traveling, and they're taking over, and they're just conquering peoples after peoples after peoples. Again, in the very first one, that uh, first dot right here, you see that they, can, uh, they conquer the Rephaim. Then they defeat the Zuam. That's the next dot right over here. And then eventually they defeat the Emin, which is the third dot right over here. So they are just slowly taking down, just conquering everybody who stands in their way. And then in verse 6, we see the bottom conquering down here. These two dots down over here, the Horites. They conquer those people, and then they decide, I guess that's far enough. And so they start turning around, and they start going northbound once again, probably making their way back home, and they just continue conquering peoples after peoples. And they are winning battles, and they are shutting down the land of Canaan, and slowly, again, just dwelling this rebellion that's, that's trying to say that we don't want to obey these four kings anymore. And so here we enter into verse 8 and 9, which again just reestablishes the players for us once again. And they say that they come to this battle in the Valley of Siddam. Again, that's this little dot right over here, towards the very, very middle of this map. So uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other, four, uh, other three kings, five kings in total, battle against these four kings. And ultimately, they start to lose. Like in verse 10, you hear this kind of reference of these butamen pits, these tar pits essentially is what they really are. Um, and 
honestly, that's even just kind of a reference. What we're going to see, uh, I think it's in Genesis 19, if I'm not mistaken, where Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. I think you even see reference to how some of that comes about when looking at these tar pits. Because again, tar is extremely flammable. And if things kind of go light, if something lights them up, all of them kind of light up. So you kind of see this foreshadowing of how these cities are going to come to a ruin. But anyway... Coming back into where we are now, again, here we look at this situation in verse 11 where we see again that the four kings have defeated the five rebellion, rebellious kings and they've quenched this rebellion as much as they can and they've now taken all the possessions, all of everything that has belonged to all of the four kings and the entire land. They now have everything in their possession and they now start progressing northbound. So again, hopefully that makes a little bit more sense of seeing them travel from the northeast and just making their way all the way down and then eventually traversing back up and just conquering all of that. So that's the first 11 verses in visual form. So hopefully that helps a little bit more because again, reading through it, you kind of hear all the names and I kind of get lost in it. I get what's happening, but I can think the picture I think helps a lot. So um, I'm going to pause on the picture there because you can see there's still some more arrows that we're going to get to, but we'll see how that story continues to develop as it goes. So I'm going to pick it up here in verse 12 and we'll continue to see what happens next. Uh, I'm sorry, if you guys can, uh, somebody in the back, if you can hit, I think it's F three to clear the background. I did not realize uh, I had done that, but either way. So uh, they also look the, they, again, being the four kings, they also took Lot, the son of Adam's brother, or Abram's, excuse me, brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and they went their way. <coughs> so again, I'm just pulling this one verse because I think there's something we can learn just from looking at this situation of seeing where Lot has been and what has happened to him now. And so again, I think as we read through, again, we saw in verse 11, the four kings conquered everything and they're taking all the possessions and they're moving northbound. And here we read in verse 12 that they came across Lot, that Lot was living in Sodom. And so because he was living in Sodom, they took him prisoner and they took all of his possessions and they took everything that he owned and they went up with it as well. And I think the lesson that we kind of pull apart here in looking at, and looking at Lot's situation is that sin is a slippery slope. Right, that sin continues to be something that when you take one step in the wrong direction, it just continues to pull you down bit by bit by bit. Now, I'll admit that in this passage, in this verse specifically, it doesn't really lean onto what I'm teaching here. So I am kind of balancing this line of what we in the theology world called exegesis, where it's, it's reading the passage and pulling out the lesson from there, versus eisegesis, where I'm reading the passage and I'm pulling in what I want to pull into it. Um, so I'm balancing that line just a little bit here as we're looking at what it means for the slippery slope and looking at Lot. But I think this fits in the theme of the entire Bible as we kind of look at Lot's situation and all the situations. Of, of everything that we read through in our Bible. And so, again, looking at this, I covered in the recap earlier, then again, Lot chose this side of the land. Right? That Lot saw that this was beautiful land, and he decided to settle there. And Moses, in writing this, he also tells us, sitting in that Sodom was a wicked place, that the men there were sinners who were against the Lord. And so, granted to, to Lot's benefit, again, he may not have known that. He just saw, this is a beautiful place. I think it'd be nice to settle here and to raise my family here. He may not know that Sodom is an evil place, but he does settle near Sodom. And given enough time, you're going to know the area that you're in. You're going to know that that may not be the best place that I should be in. That city over there is maybe not the best place that I should venture into. Right? If you don't go to Las Vegas, but you live near Las Vegas, you start to realize what's happening in Las Vegas. You start to recognize the bad things that happen in Las Vegas. So you can't just say like, oh, my house is Las Vegas adjacent and I have no idea what happens over there. You, you pick up on the things that are happening, whether from the people traveling around you or maybe that you've gone to visit and you can see the things that are happening. Regardless of whatever it is, Lot eventually makes the decision. We have no idea why, but he says, I'm going to move into Sodom. Like he takes it a step further. He was Sodom adjacent. He had settled near the land of Sodom, but now he has moved fully into the land of Sodom. Right? Whatever decision he had, whatever reasoning he had behind it, he decided to take that extra step into what is known as the wicked place of Sodom. And I think that's what sin does for us. Right? It's taking that one step. It's seeing something that's not quite the way that we know it's supposed to be, and not saying that, like, I want to dive deep into that, right? None of us wake up in the morning and think, like, I feel like sinning today. Like, I feel like going against God. Right? But you, you wake up and you see something you know that you shouldn't. You do something that you know you shouldn't. And it just leads you deeper and deeper and deeper down that slope into sin. 
Again, looking through the Bible, we have multiple examples of this. But just one I want to pull out in particular. So again, you look at King David. When King David was sitting in his palace, he was relaxing and looking off in the balcony. And he sees Bathsheba bathing. And he easily could, in that moment, just been like, I'm not supposed to see this woman. I could go and turn and face another direction. I could go downstairs. I could join my men in battle where I'm really supposed to be. But instead, he chooses, I'm going to act upon something. And on acting upon something, he calls her. He finds out that she is married. And he says, I still want to have relationships with her. And in having relations, he impregnates her. And in impregnating her, now he's got to try to cover up the situation. So he calls her husband back home and he tries to trick him. He tries to manipulate him into having relations with his wife so that she would then th- he would then think that that's his kid. But when that fails, now he leads himself to killing off this man. Then he sends this man to his death simply because he chose not to look away. He saw something he knew he shouldn't have looked at. He acted on something that he knew he shouldn't have done. He tries to cover up something that he knows he didn't do was right. And now he kills somebody to try to fix everything. Right? I promise you, David did not wake up thinking, I want to commit murder today. I want to kill somebody's husband today. But ultimately, that's what happened as sin continued to pull him further and further and further down the slope. And I think that's what happens with us. Right? Maybe you're not thinking like, oh, I want to go and have gossip with my friends today. But you interact with the conversation and it goes a certain direction. And instead of turning away, instead of correcting it, you kind of just lean into it a little bit more. You don't feel like being the odd one out and correcting them or, or stepping away because you know you shouldn't have. Maybe you decide, ah, what's, what's another drink? What's another bar to go to? Even though you're struggling with trying to stay sober. Or maybe even just for yourself. Maybe you're, you know that your phone leads you to something that you shouldn't be looking at. And instead of finding an app, instead of finding a way to remove that from you, you just continue to dive deeper into it. Again, sin is always looking to take us deeper. Sin never just says, that's enough. Like, you've sinned enough. It's always going to pull you deeper and deeper. And so it's the slippery slope that we have to watch out for. And again, I think that's what we learned just watching Lot's situation here. Seeing what Lot has done and the slippery slope that he has committed himself to. And not only just being near Sodom, but diving deeper into Sodom. And now he's suffering part of the consequences for it. And we'll see later on that again, he gets kind of salty later on as well. Hence, if you know it, if you don't, it's okay. We'll catch up to that part later. So, again, let me jump back into the story. Let us continue to see again what's happening here uh, as we continue through verse 13. So verse 13 reads, Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living in the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite's brother of Eshcol and Aner. These were the allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them, that by, against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobath, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. So again, seeing this response of Abram, we see that, that there's power in faith. Right? That there's power when we trust and who God is. That when we make moves according to God's promises, God's power is on full display. So again, continuing in our journey, looking at this map once again. And I'm going to ask you guys, once we finish with this map, you're going to have to clear it again. Um, So looking at this map again, we see this new blue line up here. I don't know how blue you can see it. But again, if you look on it on your computer, if you're streaming, you probably notice it a little bit more. There's a blue line on this left over here. And I call this player three's enter the battle. Right? So we have the situation where the kings are, are returning back up north. But they don't realize that they've angered Lot, that, all, that I'm sorry, that they've angered Abram. That Abram hears from one person who has escaped through all this carnage and through this wreckage. And he finds Abram and he says, your kinsman Lot has been taken captive, him and all his possessions. And so Abram immediately jumps into action. And he calls forth 318 of his own trained servants. That they go forth to intercept the kings and they meet them here at Dan, which is just a little bit north up here. So here at Dan, they meet the kings, and he defeats them, and he starts chasing them and pursuing them out of the land of Canaan. Again, what's crazy to kind of think about as we gather and see just how miraculous of a miracle this was, how, how crazy of a victory this is. We don't have all the numbers because they didn't give us all to him. All we know is, again, Abram has 318 men of his own. He has some other allies with him, but we don't really know how many of those are. But he's battling against four kings. 
kings and their entire armies. So easily to say, a conservative estimate would be that he's probably outnumbered. Him and his, Abram and his allies are easily outnumbered four or five to one. Conservative estimates. Could be higher, could be maybe a little lower, but four to five to one is an easy estimate. So let's just say him and their men, they have a thousand people. That means those thousand people are fighting against four or five thousand men. But not only are they outnumbered, you have to remember that Abram is like 75 or 80 years old. He's not exactly a spry young guy. He's not going to be charging in first and foremost. He'll be lucky if he kind of creeps in at this age. So he's old. The commander is not somebody who's going to be charging into battle. So they're outnumbered. The commander's old. And they're fighting against an army that's just gone an 8-0 onslaught. Right? If you count them all the little battles that they've gone through, the four armies have defeated person after person, people after people. So they have motivation. They have morale behind them. And still, somehow... Abram and his allies, they overtake these four kings. They defeat these four kings at night. And it's just the power that we see of faith. That Abram easily could have made this story, the one that that he gets known for as being a hero. He could have easily gone down as a legend because of this miraculous battle that he wins. And to a certain extent, that's kind of what happens because we look at this story now. We see how miraculous this battle is. But ultimately, again, Abram understood that this was not his victory. He understood that this was God's victory. That this was a victory through God who made it possible. And you might be asking, like, where where was Abram's faith in that? He never turned to God or looked towards God in these passages. We just read that again. He heard about Lot and he went to action. And we'll see here in just a moment. We'll see his faith displayed as we continue to see what all transpired between these things that have happened here for us. So let's continue and see, again, Abram's faith come to show us what has happened. And so again, if you guys in the back can clear uh, the background, uh, F3, we'll get rid of that map for us here. So again, we're going to read from verses 17 to verse 20. Yeah, and I'm going to see if you guys in the back can clear that map for me. Just hit uh, F3 if you can, and I'll get rid of that uh, map there. Thank you. All right, so... Uh, verse 17, after his return from the defeat of Shedolomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley. And then uh, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemy into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And so in these verses here, we see that we are introduced to the king of righteousness. And that we are introduced to King Melchizedek, a significant figure in our Bible. And I will do my best to kind of break this down in the time that we have. But I promise you, I'm going to leave some things into dust. So again, if you want to do your own study on King Melchizedek, there's a lot to kind of learn and to see of what he is. But real quick, again, in verse 17, we see that there's this mention of the king of Sodom. We're going to put him on hold. He's going to be on the table. We're going to get to him at the very back end of this. So they just kind of mentioned that the king of Sodom is here and King Melchizedek is here as well. And so first, King Melchizedek, he approaches and he speaks with Abram. And in verse 18, you see that he brings out the bread and the wine. right? He blesses Abram for it. He brings out the bread and the wine because he is a priest. And Melchizedek, in verse 19, he blesses Abram and he gives thanks to God for delivering the enemies into his hands. And then finally, in verse 20, we see Abram kind of affirming this blessing, receiving this blessing, and bestowing the blessing back when he gives him a a tithe. He gives him a tenth. That's literally tithe. Tithe is a tenth of all the spoils of the war that he's just gone through. All the things he had collected in defeating these four kings, he gives a tenth of all of it to Melchizedek. So that's kind of what happens in the story. Now let's look into who is Melchizedek just a little bit more. See, Melchizedek actually means king of righteousness. In Hebrew, Melek means king, and Zedek means righteousness. So really, when you say King Melchizedek, you're kind of saying king, king of righteousness. It's a little bit redundant. It's kind of how some people said, like, oh, I'm going to go to the ATM machine. Like, you're going to go to the automated teller machine machine. Right? If you say, please, RSVP, please respond, please. Right? So it's a little redundant, kind of funny. That's just how the language kind of worked out. But that's officially what his name means. Melchizedek means king of righteousness, and he is a king. He's the king of Salem, which is eventually what kind of turns into Jerusalem. Salem is kind of the short name for Jerusalem. And all of this foreshadows 
who, who, who comes after him. Right? That he bestows the bread and the wine upon Abram. Just as Jesus bestowed the bread and the wine upon his disciples. That ultimately, again, he is called a priest. And his role as a priest is significant. Remember that Jesus is also known as a priest. But Jesus is also known as our king. And we know that Jesus comes from the line of David. So how can Jesus be king and priest when the priests come from the line of Levi? We have two different bloodlines. How can Jesus come from two different bloodlines at the same time? That's because he doesn't. He comes from the line of David, but his priesthood comes from Melchizedek. Melchizedek being the priest is the foreshadow of Jesus being our high priest. In Psalms 110, King David speaks of Jesus as the priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Right? That Jesus fulfills everything, that there's no contradiction. That people will point to this and say that Jesus could not have been priest and king at the same time because of the bloodline contradiction. But this shows you that there is a way that he is king and he is high priest. And the reason why this is so significant is because the high priest is the one who makes the sacrifice for the people. The high priest is the one who says, your sins are forgiven because I have offered the sacrifice to God on your behalf. And so when Jesus comes and he offers his life as a sacrifice, he doesn't do that just as a man. He does that as a priest. He does that as our savior. He offers his life as the sacrifice for our sins so that when we look at God, when God looks at us, we are seen as righteous. We are seen as forgiven. We are seen as clean because our high priest has sacrificed for us. Now, one last note on Melchizedek is some might even argue that Melchizedek is the pre-incarnate Jesus. Right? That Melchizedek might have been Jesus in the Old Testament before he was shown fully in the New Testament. If you look at Hebrews 7, I think it's verse 3. In Hebrews 7, it shows that Melchizedek was without father and without mother. No beginning, no end. Resembling the Son of God. If you take all of that literally, the only person who could be described that way would be Jesus. But there's figurative ways that you can take that too. And there's debate of, should that be taken literally or should that be taken figuratively? Ultimately, we don't have an answer. I'm not going to give you a definitive one because that's an ongoing debate for millennia at this point. And it's okay if we argue on this and differ on this. Ultimately, again, what we have to see here is that, again, Melchizedek is the priest. The priest who Jesus echoes through his line. And ultimately, again, it continues to show us the fulfillment of the prophecies time and time again. And so that's why Melchizedek is such a significant figure in our Bible. And something that, again, we should kind of study through and see all the things that we have. Because this is kind of the first and the last time we kind of see Melchizedek. He pops up in a couple of other references. But that's about it. So it's an easy character reference to kind of study through and just see all that he does. And so finally, again, let's pick up the last bit of this. And we'll close out here in verses 21 through 24. And so the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourselves. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but that the young men have eaten and share of the men with, who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkel, and Mamre take their share. And so this last part that we look at here is that our sources matter. Right, that it's tempting to, to take things from outside. It's tempting to use things from outside of God's blessings, of God's sovereignty. But ultimately, in faith, we have to trust that God does things in his sovereignty and we use the blessings only from God. So again, in complete contrast to King Melchizedek, the king of Sodom comes forth and he doesn't ask for, he doesn't come to bless Abram. He actually asks ultimately really for a blessing, for grace from Abram. He tells him, give me back my people, but you can keep all the other things, all the possessions, all the, the gold, the silver, whatever else is there. You can keep all of that. Just give me back the people. And Abram says, and again, he affirms, again, his faith, once again, he affirms it first with King Melchizedek when he says, and he gives him his tithe. He says, I believe in you as high priest. I believe in you as the priest of who God is and the faithfulness that he's given in delivering his enemies to me. And at the same time, in talking to the king of Sodom, he says, I have made a vow with God. I have lifted my hand and said to him that there will be nothing that comes from you, king of Sodom. Nothing from anybody else in this world other than what God has given to me. 
I take only the things that God has given to me, and those are the things that I will use to bless others as he has promised to me. So Abram refuses to let the wrong sources influence him. He continues to want to let everybody know that everything that he has, all the success, all the blessings that he has, comes from one person, one person only, from God, the Lord Most High, the creators of the heavens and earth. And again, I think this is another lesson that we can learn from this as well. That it's easy for us in our day and age that we can find ways to do things outside of God's will. That we can lie, we can cheat, we can steal, we can manipulate others, we can humiliate others to get our way. We can deviate from the way that God has commanded us to do things in order for us to get ahead in life. That we can look to other sources other than God for pathways to success. But it takes true faith to see beyond the physical, to see beyond the societal, to see beyond the immediate benefit, and ultimately see the everlasting salvation that lies in God's faith. And so to close for us this morning, I kind of ask that question to you now. How are you doing with that? How are you pursuing God's blessings more than your own? How are you pursuing the will of God in your life? How are you looking beyond what you can do and instead towards what Christ has done for you? Again, just in a spiritual sense, are you trying to earn your salvation? Are you still trying to think of ways where you can continue to be a good person? Where you can continue to be somebody who who does more good things than bad things? Who tries to earn your way into heaven? Are you trying to be good enough to make it? Or again, are you putting your faith in Jesus? Are you putting your faith in a high priest who has offered his life for our sins and for our salvation? As the ultimate sacrifice once and for all so that we would be made righteous and given eternal salvation. Are you putting your faith in Jesus' way of doing things so that you can see how you can be blessed and be a blessing? Are you continuing to see, again, just the way that Jesus wants you to do things rather than the way that the world calls you to do things? And so if you have questions of how that's supposed to be applied, if you have questions of what that really means, of struggles that you've gone through, then I, and I hope you kind of do, then I encourage you, again, we're going to have Sunday school here in just a little bit where we'll dive deeper into these discussions, dive deeper into these kinds of questions, and have opportunities where we can share and encourage one another of how we've seen God be faithful. But again, if this is you this morning, that you've made a decision, that you've seen these things, and you've seen the faithfulness of God, you've seen how Christ has moved in your life, and you want to make that commitment, you want to trust in Him as your high priest, to trust in Him as your king, if you want to make that commitment for the very first time, then again, we'd love to partner alongside you, we'd love to, to encourage you, and to see, again, what does that life look like? What does it mean to make a commitment to Christ once and for all? And we'd love to tell you of what it means to be a disciple and a disciple maker. Of what it means to be a blessing and to bless others as well. And so again, if you have any questions about that, if you've made that decision, again, I'll be down here up front during the song of response. I'll be here after the service. Again, we'd love nothing more here at West Houston just to continue to partner alongside you and encourage you and help develop you into a better reflection of Christ as we all pursue that here at church as well. So with that, again, I hope and I pray that you would make that commitment, that you would dive deeper into who God is and who God wants you to be and continue to shape yourself and see, again, just where it is that God is leading you to. To see, again, what resources, what blessings has God given you so that you can continue to go forth and bless others. How you continue to go forth and make disciples of all nations. To make new disciples and to make disciples deeper in Him. So with that, again, if you have any questions, we'd love to engage with you in conversation. We'd love nothing more, again, just to celebrate the decision you've made today. So with that, let me pray for us, and we'll continue to sing in response here this morning. Father, again, we thank you and we love you because you are so good. That you have sent your son, again, down here to earth to rescue us from ourselves. That we continue to choose sin time and time and time again. That we continue to slip on this slope and fall deeper into it. And it's only by your grace, through your son's sacrifice on the cross, that we are redeemed. That we are made whole. That we are made righteous. And so, Father, I pray that you would just continue to move in each and every one of us. Soften our hearts. Open up our minds. Let us see what it is that you have in store for us. And let's continue just to, again, pursue you in all the things that we do. So God, I pray that you would just continue to, to work within us and okay? continue to open us up. And allow us to take that step forward, whether to put our faith in you for the first time or again, to take that courageous step forward to have a conversation with somebody. 
to talk to them, to speak out to them, to let them know of how good you are. And so, Father, we just pray that you would continue to give us faith like Abram has. That in his ups and downs, again, we continue to see his faithfulness. And we just pray, God, that you would let that faithfulness be echoed in our lives as well. And so, God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you just for your goodness. And we thank you for your son on the cross. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.